The Christian trust is something like this, that what we accomplish here below will be taken up into God's eternity and elevated, transfigured. Welcome back to the Word on Fire show. I'm Brandon Vaught, the host and the senior publishing director at Word on Fire. Death is a topic that most of us try to avoid. So why does Catholicism teach that we should actually meditate regularly on our death? And how does Christianity answer the challenges posed by death? That's what we'll be discussing today with Bishop Robert Barron, who joins us from our Rochester studio. Bishop, good to see you. Hey, Brandon. Good morning. Good to see you, as always. Several months ago, you attended a meeting with your brother bishops. It was your regular USCCB gathering. And at that meeting, the bishops elected a handful of representatives to send to Rome in October for the forthcoming Synod on Synodality. And you were elected. It kind of was kept under wraps for many, many months, but the, the Pope just publicly ratified those appointments. So tell us what this event is. I know we've actually talked about it a couple times on this show, but what are you personally expecting and hoping for at the Synod? Well, I don't know. This Synod will be different, I think. I was at the last one. I was elected as well to the Synod on Young People. And that one, I think, was a bit more straightforward. That we, we knew the topic, and we were just going to go, and the bishops were going to debate, and then we'd, we'd uh, issue a statement. This one, I'm not as, as sure. Uh, I don't think this session will result in any kind of statement because there's going to be a follow-up session. They also have talked about not having uh, so many formal speeches. Last time around, every delegate was able to give a four-minute speech. I don't think that's going to happen this time. My impression is it'll be more like small group work and... The Instrumentum Laboris as well, last time was like a, a trial document, you might say. It was a you know pretty well-formulated document. This one is more uh, questions to guide our conversation. So it'll be a different synod. Also, we're not going to gather in the synod hall, I understand. Uh, we'll be in the Paul VI audience area, I think. So anyway, I don't know for sure what this will be. It'll be you know a bit of an adventure to find out. I'm sure we'll be talking a lot about it here on the Word on Fire show. In fact, I believe Word on Fire has plans to offer some sort of coverage yep. in and around the Senate in October. So we'll definitely have more to say as the month nears. For now, though, let's talk about the topic of death. We're nearing the 400th episode of the Word on Fire show. I don't think Jeez. we've ever done one on the topic of death, I don't which, think is, so. which is interesting. You know, for centuries, Christians have practiced a discipline known as memento mori, maybe translated as remember death or remember your death. Where did this practice come from and why is it a healthy discipline? Well, it's pretty ancient. It goes back to the, you know, monastic traditions. Um, there was, I remember my mother telling me about this when I was a little kid. She thought, thought it was fascinating. I think in certain Trappist communities, uh, they were encouraged every day to dig a shovel of their own grave. <laughs> so that was the memento mori. I think too of um, um, Keith Richard of the Rolling Stones wears this big ring with a with a death's head on it, and he was once asked, you know, why do you wear that ring? And he said, well, memento mori. I thought, well, okay, fair enough, <laughs> you know. Um, why is it a good practice? Well, for all kinds of reasons, but you won't really live your life in this world properly unless and until you are very much aware of the fact of death, because. If you just think, well, this life is everything. It, there's this life, and that, that's that's the whole frame of reference for every choice I make and so on. You'll live your life entirely differently than if you say, no, I'm going to die. There's a limitation to this life. And we would say, I'm invited to a richer and higher and more satisfying life beyond this one. Well, it, that's going to change your whole approach to life. So to be reminded of death on a regular basis is extremely important. Mind you, too, anyone that prays the Hail Mary, right? You, you, you pray the rosary. Well, you are 50 times reminding yourself of your own death. Pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. And we, we say it 50 times every time you say the rosary. So it's a very salutary exercise. Um, it'll change the way you approach your own life if you really let that consciousness sink in. Many commentators have noted how the modern world has a very unique approach to death. For centuries and centuries, 
most people died early, obviously, but they also died in their homes, surrounded by friends, surrounded by family. Death was just a, a normal part of existence, familiar even to children. However, today, most people typically die in sterile, sanitized hospitals or elderly care facilities, often away from family, away from children. In fact, it's common for many people never to have seen someone die. Uh, why do you think our culture pushes death to the peripheries? And what does that say about our approach to death? Yeah, we're afraid of it, are we? You know, uh, keep it at bay. I, I don't want to see it. I don't want to talk about it. Uh, let's deal with it as quickly and sanitarily as we possibly can. But I think you're absolutely right there, Brandon, that years ago, it was much more part of life. And, and people were closer... Uh, you know, to animals, uh, to to the the world of nature, and they saw animals dying, um, and wakes. You know, were typically held in someone's home. So someone died at home. The body was was laid out, was displayed probably in the in the parlor of the home. Um, there is something that's very healthy about that. That people, as you say, saw the the very process of of dying, and they saw their their loved one uh, there in their own home. There is something, I think, um, very rich and positive about that. And, and we have sanitized the experience of death. I think we're embarrassed by it and we're frightened of it. And so we just want to keep it as much at bay as we can. The, you know, the famous book from years ago now, The Denial of Death, but that's a key theme in our um, increasingly secularized Western culture. Um, did you see recently, it was um, uh, Schwarzenegger, came on and just said, you know, you know, they asked, what happens when you die? Well, you go in the ground and you rot. Yeah, that's it. And then he said, I, I'm just, I'm just really angry about this because I, I love my life and it's rich and it's full and I, and I'm just going to die and that's it. I, I'm angry at it. And I thought that's kind of both sides of the secular thing. Like, okay, that's all we got. And we go in the ground and rot. So the only reaction you can have is just, I'm just, I'm just mad about it. You know, well, that's a, total turning around of a, of a Christian or a classically religious approach to death. Um, acknowledging it, yeah, we do go in the ground and rot. I mean, our, our bodies do, and that's important too, to acknowledge that. But it's not, okay, that's it. <laughs> that's the end. And therefore, I, I'm just in a kind of a rage about it. I thought that was telling. Um, you know, Schwarzenegger certainly had a Catholic formation and a Catholic background. And I think when I was in California, they always said he went to mass regularly, but I thought that lesson didn't sink in his understanding of death. And get your thoughts on how the media portrays death. Um, it struck me that if aliens came to our planet and spent a few hours watching our TV shows, our movies, our video games, they would think we're obsessed with death. Death is yes. everywhere. The most popular shows, murder mysteries, people getting killed yeah. left and right, video games, people getting shot left and right. But what strikes me as somewhat paradoxical is despite being saturated in death, most of the deaths in the media are hyper-violent, sudden, yeah. spectacular deaths. Very rarely do you just see an ordinary person dying in an ordinary way, surrounding by their family. What do you think that says the the media's portrayal of death. Yeah, I don't. It's interesting. It's interesting. I, in one way, you know, storytellers have always been obsessed with two things. They always say sex and death. You might say the the highest pleasure in this life and the thing we're most afraid of. And so, go back time immemorial, storytellers, and then you know, poets and playwrights, and now filmmakers. Sex and death are the two things that that we probably talk about the most. But I take your point. It's interesting about the the violent portrayal of violent death um i don't know i don't know are, are we um are we just afraid of of the normality of it in a way uh that we have to hyper dramatize it so that it maybe that that makes it easier to, to bear or something i'm not sure but uh that we want to divert our attention from call it the spiritual dimension of death i think that's true i think that's true we don't want people to meditate upon it in a salutary way. The memento mori thing is a is an uplifting. That's a spiritually powerful way of thinking about death, as opposed to kind of voyeuristic or hey, look at how amazing that is. And but you, know, on the other hand, I'm just kind of thinking this thing through. Um, you know, why are we so fascinated by by watching people get killed? Well, it's because 
we know our our time is coming and uh almost despite ourselves maybe we we are fascinated by it we're drawn to to death to think about it to muse on it um you know what guys interesting uh brandon larry king remember the famous interviewer who died not many years ago he typically asked every person he interviewed what happens after we die and he had from billy graham to the you know the most ardent atheist he'd ask that same question and you could really tell he was interested in the answer. He he wanted to know. And he was very skeptical. He wasn't like a religious man. But he also, he fought against. I remember one time he said that I, I just, I die and forever and ever I'm just gone. And you could tell it wasn't just a rhetorical device. He, he really he wrestled with that. I thought, well, okay, fair enough. That's like a, a secular person today trying to come to terms. And then Schwarzenegger, I'm angry at it, you know? Well, it's it's the loss of a religious context for uh, thinking about death. Well, let's move there now to the religious and specifically Christian approach to death. It struck me recently, the deeper I've gotten into the Liturgy of the Hours, which is, is of course, centered around the Psalms, how yeah. often the Bible speaks about yes. death. It's everywhere. It's the golden thread from Genesis through the Psalms to history of Israel through Jesus, Paul, Revelation. It's its everywhere. What is the Bible's ultimate message about death? Well, of course, the Bible's very interesting. The Old Testament, there there's an evolution, I think, in the consciousness of Israel. There is a large part of the Old Testament that would hold kind of the Schwarzenegger view. I mean, that, that death is just the end. And in fact, you see it in the Psalms, you know, and can, can the dust praise you? What that means is, Hey, once I go down into the ground, I, I mean, I'm done. There's no more praising. And so, Lord, rescue my life because once I'm in the grave, I can't give you praise, right? So th- there's a very strong strain within the Old Testament of just, yeah, this life is it. And when you die, you die. Another strain as the Old Testament unfolds is uh, shadowy Sheol, you know, that we die. We don't entirely disappear. Something like our spirit goes to this shadowy underworld which is not at all attractive or interesting. It's not a place of paradise or heaven. It's like a sad half-life, right? But it's better than nothing, I suppose. Think of here the prophet Samuel, right? He's being called by the witch of Endor back from shadowy Sheol. You find that too in the Psalms too, go down into, into the depths and all that. And then certainly by Jesus' time, a strain is emerging within Judaism that says, no, the righteous dead shall arise on the last day. And I think that's being born of a sense of God's justice and of God's goodness and righteousness. I mean, why would God make all these human beings and call them to righteousness and then that's it? So that strain is there. You see it in the Pharisees. Mind you, in the, in the New Testament, the Pharisees and the Sadducees fight. Because the Sadducees represent that older view that, nope, death is just it, and you know there are no angels, there's no spirits, all that. And the Pharisees are saying, no, no, there are all such things. Jesus clearly would side with the Pharisees. Then there's the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. And now Christianity, which comes up indeed out of Judaism, but has a completely unexpected ratification of the view that indeed there's a resurrection of the dead. And not just a survival of the soul that you might find in, let's say, Greek philosophy, but the resurrection of the dead. You might say what was expected of all the righteous dead at the end of time happened within time with the resurrection of Jesus. And then in that, we begin to find hope. So Paul will say, Jesus is the first fruits of those who've fallen asleep. So he's the first sign. He's the morning star. He's the indication of what God intends for all of the righteous dead. So that's the New Testament Christian perspective, born of the resurrection, coming up out of this kind of loamy, complex Jewish background, but finding this ratification in the resurrection. And I think, you know, in Paul, everything hinges upon the resurrection. Without the resurrection, all the Christian faith falls apart. I think that's true. Um, So that gives us now the right context for understanding death. I've recently been reading this great book called Remember Death by Matthew McCullough, Remember Death, Memento Mori. And McCullough identifies 
four devastating problems that death poses to us, the four things that frighten most people about death. So these would be identity, what death says about who you are, it destroys you. Futility, what death does to anything you accomplish on this earth. Loss, what it does to anything that we love uh, on this earth. And then life, how it robs us of all of our earthly joys, the things we take delight in here on this earth. And yet he shows how the death and resurrection of Christ turns these problems on their head and in many ways resolves them, solves them. Um, so I thought let's let's talk through each one of those sure. four aspects of death that most frighten us. So first, identity. Most people like Larry King, Arnold Schwarzenegger, worry that death yeah. destroys their identity. When you die, you are no more. How does Christ eclipse this problem that death poses to our identity? Yeah, well, he he solves it because we see the continuity between uh, the pre-resurrection Jesus and the resurrected Jesus. There's a difference indeed, you know, the fact that people don't recognize him right away. Uh, he's seen as a transfigured, elevated uh, version of himself, but nevertheless, it's the same Jesus. So there's the continuity um, of identity. And then like in our theological speculation, we'll talk about the soul. So even as our bodies indeed go into the ground and, and decay, but the soul, you might say the deepest self or the, the seat of our identity uh, remains because it's not tied to matter. It'll be rejoined to an elevated, transfigured matter. That's true, the resurrection of the body. But you might say soul is the guarantor of um, our identity across the threshold of death. Let's look at that second one, futility, what death does to anything that we accomplish here on earth. After we die, everything that we have built and accomplished in this world will eventually fade away and on secularism will be ultimately futile. How does Christianity answer this problem? Remember, Brad, it was a couple of years ago, uh, two people that we, we both admire, William Lane Craig and Jordan Peterson, were debating this point. And Craig was making the strong kind of Christian claim that, that look, if there is no God, if, if there's no you know, spiritual realm, no eternal life, things are just kind of pointless ultimately. And at the time, anyway, Peterson was kind of arguing, well, no, there's, you can still find meaning within you know, the limited framework of this world. And you know, I, I get Peterson's point. Yes, you can. You, Michelangelo you know, creates the David, and there it is. And even for hundreds of years, people can enjoy the, that statue. But do you ever think about this? You know, the Earth in in the far distant future will just become a cinder. It'll be, it'll be consumed, and every little thing from Shakespeare to Michelangelo to every every film ever made, every historical achieve, all of it will simply, you know, burn up. So I think it is true. If that's the case, then ultimately, nothing we accomplish here below has has meaning. You could say it has meaning for a time or it serves a limited purpose, you know, for the few people that will take it in. Uh, but I think that's simply true, that that if there is no God, no eternal life, they are kind of futile. The Christian trust is something like this, that what we accomplish here below will be taken up into God's eternity and elevated, transfigured, uh, moved to a higher pitch. Will the marble that makes up Michelangelo's David eventually be destroyed? Of course it will, right? But will somehow Michelangelo's David, that great accomplishment, will it be transfigured and taken up into a higher dimensional system? Something like that. Or like our acts of love here below. And you say a simple act of kindness for someone. You say, well, you know, so what? You're both going to die and, you know, or you... You help someone in, in Africa who's starving, and they say, well, so what? What's the point? You know, they're, they're all going to die anyway. But some of those acts which participate even now in the love that God is will be taken up and transfigured uh, in the eternal dimension. That solves the problem, I think, of futility. Um, no, no, we do what's right and good and beautiful now within a higher context of meaning. Let's look at the problem of loss, what death does to anything or anyone we love. Given naturalism, whenever someone we love dies, a friend, spouse, a child, or some good circumstance in our life ends, that's it. There's no hope of getting it back. 
What does Christianity say to this peril of loss? Love is more powerful than death. And that's not a sentimental claim. That's a metaphysical claim. The divine love is more powerful than death. And I think, Brandon, we do feel that when it comes to our loved ones. And I, I know my, my father died many, many years ago, but I, I still have a very, I would say, vibrant relationship with him. Uh, my love for him, his for me, is stronger than death, transcends it. Um, and I think we can sense that. We know it theologically. We say, well, God is love and God's eternal and God draws all things to himself. And so, yeah, I can make that claim. But also, I think I, I feel it, I sense it, um, that we still stay in contact with those that we love, even though the, the body has, has faded away. It's a mystery. We're, we're hooking ourselves onto a very high, complex mystery of, I'd say, dimensionality. There, there's this dimension of our ordinary experience, time and space and the world of our senses, and we're attuned to that world. And, and the Aquinas says that we, we cling to it because that's our natural habitat. Of course we do. That's the world that we know. But at the same time, and, and it happens through things like mathematics, through great moral acts, through great acts of beauty, we reach up beyond this world to a higher world. We get in touch with a higher world. And you and I have talked about that a lot. Um, something as simple as mathematics, that when you, you grasp a mathematical truth and you know it as true, you have left this world in, in a very real sense. Or better, you've, you've attained a transcendent perspective because you're beyond the merely changeable, even essence quality of this world. The same is true, I think, of, of love. When you have really entered into that relationship with another person, you've transcended this ordinary experience. Um, it's a deep mystery, but I think that's how we would handle that problem of, of the loss of loved ones. They're not really lost if, if we love them in God. Let's turn now to that fourth and final challenge that death poses to each one of us, namely that it robs us of earthly joys. This gets back to the Schwarzenegger comment. It seems yeah. that everything we love most is on this side of death. You know, think of our favorite pleasures, music, art, yeah. relationships, experiences, joys. It's hard to imagine any sort of afterlife without those things. So on Christianity, how can the afterlife be better than this life when it doesn't include those earthly joys? What well, will in a transfigured way I've used that image of, of uh, you know, the circle becoming a sphere or the, the square becoming a, a, a cube. It's not that the square is lost. It's been brought up into a higher mode of existence. Um, it's been transfigured and elevated and enhanced in its being. See the things of this world as sacraments of a higher order, a higher goodness, a higher beauty. They're not lost. They're transfigured. So that what we experience here is an anticipation. So instead of saying like, wow, wasn't that great, but I'm going to die and so who cares? Or Boy, I'm going to lose all this. Say, no, all of this is but a hint of what's to come. It's a, it's a sign of what's to come. You know, I might have used this brand with you before, but it's always struck me as interesting. Is If you were to talk to an eight-year-old kid about the joys of, let's say, marital intimacy, Right. And, and what that means in all of its senses, physical, psychological, spiritual, the kid wouldn't know what you're talking about. I, I mean, he has no frame of reference for that. For an eight year old, you know, the best day would be I, I saw a fun movie and I had an ice cream cone and my friends and I, you know, horsed around. And that, that's it. That's his frame of reference. And you were to say, you know, there's actually something higher than all of that. None of that's bad. All of that's good. In fact, you can keep doing that in a way. But but there's a higher thing. And let me try to explain it to you. The kid, like, what? Well, so think of heaven that way, you know. There's a higher good. But I, I can't begin to fathom it here below. And even the sublimest goods in this world are nothing compared to what's to come. Eye is not seen. Ear is not heard. That's literally true, right? This eye can't see what God's planned. This ear can't possibly hear it. This year here is Beethoven's Seventh Symphony and, and finds it absolutely compelling. That's nothing compared to what the ear will hear, you know? So I, I would not look at it in terms of futility, but in terms of sacramentality. 
That's how you experience the world here below. As we wind up a close here, I'd like to ask how you recommend we prepare for death. Humans have a 100% mortality rate. We're all going to die. Right. Although most of us, other than maybe those on death row, don't exactly know when exactly that day and time will be. So what can we do here and now to prepare for our deaths? Think about it every day. I, I, I do. And that's the go back to our beginning of our conversation. Memento mori. Uh, those are good practices. Uh, and the rosary. But when you pray it, think about that very last phrase. Now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Now and at the hour of our death. As you say, there's a 100% chance we're all going to come to the hour of our death. So you're placing that beautifully within a, a sacred context. You're asking the Blessed Mother to intercede for you at that hour because likely at that hour you won't be able to intercede for yourself. That's the beauty of it. You know, maybe, maybe some people can at the very last minute, but probably most of us won't be able to. But again and again and again and again and again, we keep asking. So maybe pray the rosary with a special focus on that last phrase. Well, it's time now for our question that we take from one of our listeners. Each episode, we play one question for Bishop Barron. If you have one, send it in to us at the website, askbishopbarron.com. Today, we're hearing from Ben, who lives in Montana, and Ben has a death-related question. Here it is. Hi, Bishop Barron. This is Ben from Montana. I was wondering what we as Catholics should think about or how we should interpret near-death experience stories. Mm. Thanks for all your guidance and inspiration. Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, one thing I found when I was doing pastor work full-time is if you start talking about or asking about near-death experience, they come flooding out of people. And I think a lot of people are a little bit ashamed or they're maybe they're, they're protective of how kind of precious that experience is. So they don't talk about it. But if you just scratch the surface, out they come, out they come. And one thing um, is, you know, with the um, the rise of, of medicine, you could say that people have fewer and fewer of these things, you know. But uh, I think there's something important about them. You know, is the jury out in a way, I, you know, completely understanding all the different types of near-death experiences? Yeah. You know, people say it's just a, it's a brain uh, phenomenon. The dying brain produces these illusions and so on. But it reads uh, Father Spitzer's book, uh, you know, the great Father Spitzer, who writes a lot about religion and science. He has some of the best, I think, summation of these experiences. And there are a lot of them, Brandon, you and I both know that it's very hard to explain them in terms of, you know, brain phenomena. Some are so strange and so weird that people who have died in a clinical sense um, experience all sorts of things way outside their bodies, accurate descriptions of people and events and buildings and places. And, you know, uh, blind people who see for the first time, which are kind of very hard to explain in terms of brain physiology. So anyway, I think they're very intriguing. I, I wouldn't put full weight on them, like, boy, oh boy, there it is. There's the, you know, the, the clear proof. But I think they're very interesting. And to me, they're largely congruent with our sense of, of what happens at death. So I recommend uh, Father Spitzer's book. I'll include a show uh, link to that book in the show notes. It's called The Soul's Upward Yearning, Clues to Our Transcendent yeah, Nature. Yeah, that's right. And he's got yeah, an extensive right. section reflecting on these near-death experiences. Yeah, good. Uh, before we go here, another new book from Word on Fire. This one launches today, Monday, August 14th. It's titled Understanding the Hillbilly Thomist, the Philosophical Foundations of Flannery O'Connor's Narrative Art. And it's by Father Damien Ference, a longtime writer and friend of Word on Fire. Flannery O'Connor is one of the greatest writers of the 20th century. Her novels and short stories are shockingly violent, absurdly comic, spiritually potent, they continue to entertain and beguile people to this day. But for many encountering them for the first time, O'Connor's stories of backward prophets and outcasts feel strangely nihilistic and dark. But in this new book, Father Ferentz proposes a more precise lens for decoding Flannery O'Connor's narrative art 
which originates in her own words about herself, namely the title she gave herself as a hillbilly Thomist. The author examines the various ways in which St. Thomas Aquinas and the philosophical tr tradition of Thomism shape not only Flannery's view of reality, but the stories that she told. So check out this new book. Again, it's called Understanding the Hillbilly Thomist. It's available from Word on Fire, and I'll include a link in the show notes. Well, thanks everyone for watching and listening, and we'll see you next time on the Word on Fire show. Thank you.